you know, was, I told Pastor Brian that, uh, you know, when he came up here at the end, like during worship, not that I was having a hard time, but I felt like there was something. There was just a little bit more that the Lord was trying to bring me into. But when he came up here and he, he made that declaration of, you know, that we're going to sing that again and that he is our one thing. And then that this scripture just immediately jumped up in my spirit and it just, gosh, it just brought so much freedom to me. But, you know, Jesus told Martha, I think it's the New Living Translation. It says there's one thing worth being concerned about. And Mary had discovered it. And no matter who says that you're doing the wrong thing, no matter who says that's not what you should be doing, no matter who tries to take it from you, Jesus said it, she has discovered it and it will not be taken from her. And that's the words... That's the words of Jesus, and if he says that it will not be taken from you, then no demon in hell and no person on this planet, of this, on this planet can take it from you. Hallelujah. We pursue the one thing, and he is the one thing, and it will not be taken. When uh, Pastor Evan was talking about Jordan, it was, it was, and actually first service, Pastor Brian got up here and started talking about the talents and the things, and well, that's my message today. So I kind of got scared. I said, oh my gosh, he's going to get up there. And, you know, it was, I was like, man, but I want to talk about stewardship and being good servants today. And this is something that the Lord um, shared with me a couple weeks ago, or he not shared with me, but he, he led me into looking into this a little bit deeper and I actually shared it with my, me and my wife looked at it. And um, when they asked me to, if I wanted to preached this morning. I said, yeah. So I went to the Lord and I said, hey, what do I share? And he said, I want you to share that. Let's just take it a little bit deeper. And so this morning to the Lord is kind of leading me to do something a little bit different. So I'm going to try to really get the goody out of these things. And it's, it's going to be more like a, a, a Bible study for us. I mean, it always is at church, but you get what I'm saying. We're going to go to Matthew 25. Twenty-five, verse 14. So a steward, before we get going, is I think we can have a lot of thoughts about it, but a steward is an overseer. Or a lot of, in the word we see where it's the manager of a household or, or somebody that is manager of goods for the owner. And just as a simple, um, a simple way to look at it is you could think of like a manager of a store. Is just how the Lord was showing me. You know, does the manager own the things? No. Does the manager make all of this? He makes a lot of decisions and he manages it, but he doesn't make the, he doesn't distribute the things. But is there an expectation on the manager? Yes. yes. There is an expectation on him. So verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one, he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them, made five, five more. And likewise, the one with two gained two more. But the one that had received one dug a hole in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five more, saying, Lord, I've delivered, you delivered me five talents. Look, I've gained five more besides them. And his Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Also the one with two, the same thing. He said, well done, good and faithful. You have been faithful over a few things. Make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look there, you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money, at least in the bank, and I would have got interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one that has ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
So I'm going to read through these, and then we'll kind of go back and, and break them down a little bit. So the first thing that we see is it says that the master calls his own servants. And he gives to them the things according to what? Their own ability. The Lord knows the ability of the servants, or the master in the parable knows the ability of servants in the same way the Lord knows each of our ability. So the Lord drops something on us, and we say, Lord, I don't have the ability to do this. You wouldn't have it if you didn't. The Lord would not have brought it to us if we did not have the ability to do what he has for us to do with it. And what's interesting is the Lord doesn't micromanage. He doesn't give it to him and say, do it this way, this way, this way, and this way. Because there's freedom. But also because the Lord trusts in the ability of the servants. What kind of God? The God that created the universe trusts in your ability. Why? Because he put it there. He put it there. He knows what's in there. He knows what's in there. He gave to each according to his own ability. Down to verse Hold on, let me back up. This is something that, you know, what, and I think this is where in the natural we grab this and we begin to see it, not the way heaven sees it. If he gives each to according to his own ability, how do I say it? It's not the amount that's trusted to you that puts the value on you. But actually the opposite, the ability within you puts the value on what you've been given. Let me say that again. If Patrick is given $1,000 and John is given $100, does it change the value of the servant? No. But the ability within the servant increases the value of what he's been given. We like to look in the natural. We can, not that we like to, but we can be tempted to think they have this, so they must be. He has that. He must be. But it's the ability of the servant that's bringing the increase. I can take this piano and I can put it in front of Pastor Brian, and it's not going to do the same thing it does if you put it in front of Pastor Evan. <laughs> right? <laughs> the thing is there but who the Lord trusted to because he knows the ability within us thank you it wasn't pre-planned <laughs> he gives us the things because what's he expecting he's expecting increase Always, always expect an increase. In verse 20, it says that he had received five, made five more, and he gave it back, and he said, look, he said, I've gained these other five. And what's he say to him? He says, well done, good and faithful. So what happens? You see that the, the goodness and the faithful servant brings increase. And so what is the reward? The reward is he's trusted with more things. I heard another pastor, I mean, it's probably been more than that, but what's the reward in the kingdom? It's increased responsibility. Wow. We think, oh, I did good. Now I'm going to get the coast a little bit. <laughs> no, the kingdom and the Bible shows that when you are faithful with little, you are now ruler over much. Wow. So now there's increased responsibility comes. And also, what does he say? He says, enter into the joy of your Lord. But I think there's a two part of it because whenever we are good and faithful, we don't all, we enter into his joy. He's already loves us. He's already proud of us, but we enter into his joy. And in that joy, we find joy. Being a good steward brings the Lord joy. It brings you joy. And also there's always going to be increase. Always. Verse 24. Four, it says, then the one who had received the one talent said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. First, first thing that should throw a red flag is he's making excuses before he's even got to what he's going to say. Wow. And we don't even know if this man was that way. We know that if this is a parable, if it's referring to, 
to the Lord that we know he is not that way. He is not a harsh man. But the first thing that we see is he makes excuses. He said, and I was afraid. Fear will lie to you and have you wasting things and putting things in place that they don't belong. It'll rob you of your ability. The ability that God put there, if we yield to fear, it will actually take the life from that ability. He says, I was afraid and hid it in the ground. Look, you have what is yours. And what does he say? He says, you wicked and lazy servant. Basically, I wouldn't have gave it to you if I didn't know that you could at least. I mean, if we look by comparison, he should have at least had two because he should have had one. He should have doubled. And I've heard Pastor Brian say this before, and it just, bless you. Bless you one more time. <laughs> but I heard Pastor Brian say this one time, and it was just an eye-opening thing. He said, even if that servant would have tried and lost it, if he would have tried, the father would have gave him another. Because at least he would have tried if the heart would have been right. But what do we see? We don't see that he was just lazy. He was wicked and lazy. It's the position of the heart. He did not exercise his ability and that's, the, that's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, stewardship in the kingdom is not to guard, it's not to protect, it's not to watch over. That's part of it, but that's not what it is. In the kingdom, stewardship is you exercising the ability with what you've been given to bring increase. That's stewardship. Whatever has been put in your hands should grow. It should grow. Why? We have life that we've been given. And we can bring life to whatever we touch. Increase. What was the commandment to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and increase. Why can a man and a man and a woman and a woman not be together? They can't bring. They can't multiply. God's always looking for increase in everything. That's why he says in Romans, he says, look at creation. He said it plainly shows us. Plainly shows us things about God. God's looking for increase. Let's go to Luke 12. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's okay to be, I don't want to say nervous or intimidated, you know, but we, don't, we can't get in a place of fear. That's where the enemy comes in. To see something that's, that the Lord's given to you and say, wow, like this is big, this is a lot to do, you know, or I've never done this before. Yeah. I mean, those kind of things, but we're surrounded by people. You know, the word tells us that there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. You know, reach out to somebody, ask, get godly counsel on things. You know, go to the Lord, you know, and say, like David did, is this, is this my fight and how do I fight it if I do? You know, and he's going to, if, if he, if God puts the ability in us and he puts the thing for us to steward, he's going to give us the plan and he's going to lead you through it. He's going to lead us. All right, Luke, Luke 12, verse 35. So we're looking at stewardship and then we're looking at this where he's talking about different kinds of servants. Because there's not just a stewardship with goods and, 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 and things that he, he gives to us to bring increase, but also over other things. Verse 35, it says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. This, that's the scripture. But gosh, there's just so much in that, you know. I mean, every time I read it, I'm like, man, like, and I know that we, the Lord unveils these things to us over the years. But there's some things in here that I'm like, I can feel it. I can feel I'm knocking on it. But Lord, you know, open our minds to it. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat, and he will serve them. If he should come in the second or the third watch of the night, so blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Verse 42, it says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant 
who his master will make ruler over his house to give the, them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant. And see, look, this is, here's something where he's being entrusted with the household of the master. Not just the goods, but the people within it. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he'll make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying and is coming and begins to beat the male and female servants, since to eat, drink, and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and an hour when he's not aware. And the servant that knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to it will be beaten with stripes. But the one who did not know and committed things deserving stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, to him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, to him they will ask of more. So verse 35, it says, who is the faithful or verse 42 says, who is the faithful and wise steward? And so the first, the, right out the gate, you see in verse, it says, you yourselves be like the one that waits for the master who will return from the wedding, that when he knocks, they may open to him how? Immediately. And blessed are those servants who the master, when he comes, will find watching. Let your waist be girded and your lamp be burning. You've got to be ready and we have to be watchful. And then if you look a little bit deeper, I mean, we see, we see that the, the servant that's not ready and watchful, what is he doing? It says he's the one that's beating the other servants. He's exalted himself to a position to do things that the master wouldn't do. He's not portraying the father's heart. He's abusing the power. So what we begin to see is the actual heart of the steward or the heart of the servant is ex and look back to the other parable too what did it say before he gave him the talents he said he, he gave him the talents and then what happened where did what did he do he left this here he puts the head steward or the head servant puts him over the household and then he goes to the wedding and that's where the heart of the steward or the heart of the servant is exposed is in the absence of the master when they're not being watched because they're supposed to be watching. The things come to the surface when something's been put in their hands. What's the saying when the, when the cat's away? Mice will play. <laughs> but really, you know, it exposes the heart. It exposes the heart. You know, and my, my opinion is the one, the good and faithful servant that it says that he opens immediately and he's watching and he's feeding the, the uh, he's a, a lot. He's been put in charge of the food to a lot to the other servants each time they sit down to eat. My, my personal conviction is that he acted that way because he loved the master and he knew the master's heart. I believe somebody that's just there doing feels like they have something that I don't have is the one that mistreats others because they, on the inside, as a man thinks, so is he. They believe they are mistreated, so they mistreat others. So three things we see of a, a good or faithful and wise servant because verse 42 it says who is that faithful and wise servant we see that he expects the master's return he serves the well-beings of others and he prepares himself is the last one because it says that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare i'm gonna flip this around so just bear with me it says the servant that knew his master's will and did not prepare himself according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes so here's the the flip of that is that the master's will has been communicated and it was trusted with the servant, but he made a choice not to prepare himself. So we each have a choice to get in line with what the Father has spoken to us. And he reveals all these things by his spirit. You know, it says that he reveals the things to us that eye has not seen, ears not heard. 
So we lean in and we get the will and we begin to prepare ourselves so that we can be a faithful and wise steward and servant. Luke 16. You're good? Good, 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 good. Luke 16, verse 1. All these are really long, so y'all be here with me. <laughs> but it's one of those things where I felt like I couldn't really get, we can't get into it if we don't go through the whole thing and then come back. He also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear? Give an account of your stewardship because it's being taken from you. Then the steward said within himself, what will I do for my master's taking this, taking this stewardship away from me? I can't dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I, I know what I'll do when I'm put out of the stewardship that I can be received into somebody else's house. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said, well, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. That's the only place this word's in the Bible, too. It's interesting. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give to you your own? No servant can serve two masters. You'll either hate one or love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So what do we see right out the gate? Verse 1, it says that his stewardship was being taken from him. Why? Because he was wasting. Because he was wasting. You know, the Lord's not good. You see, when Jesus is talking about the, uh, the, uh, the parable of the wineskin, right? He says nobody puts new wine into an old wineskin. Not that this is new, but the, the point is, is nothing will be wasted. And every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. So if he has given you something, if he's given you something, it is perfect for you. I heard Catherine Coleman say this one time. She was, it was a, it was a, I mean, obviously it was an old message, but was, <laughs> it was old to me. But, but she said that, um, I think it was somebody had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, been filled with the Holy Spirit, and the thing that came out of her, the, the language, the tongues that began to come from the, the girl was so beautiful. And she said, because Jesus is perfect and he don't give anything that ain't perfect. So if the Lord is giving you something, it, if he gives me something, it may not be perfect for Keith. You know, but it's perfect for me. And it's my job to steward it correctly so I can see the value. Because only when I steward correctly will it grow and then the value will be exposed. So wastefulness can cause things to be taken from us. And it's not that God takes. I mean, if you're wasteful, you'll remove it from your life for not being a good a steward, but God is a God that gives things to us to, to see us go places. You know, God, God's a good God. First sign, it says, if you make yourselves by un, friends by unrighteous man, and when they fail, they may receive you an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust with what is much. So mammon... Mammon is material things, riches, uh, confidence in your wealth, these different things. So, so what I see is that the mammon and the material things are actually a test of stewardship to see if you can be entrusted with the other things, which, would, which to me, it seems that the true riches are going to be the eternal things. 
Because he says here, therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, something that doesn't have a good or bad, something that's not a righteous thing, something that only exposes what's on the inside of us, if we can't be faithful with something we can hold in our hands, how will you be faithful with something that will last for eternity? How could you be entrusted with, with the life of a person or, or speaking you know, words into somebody? Who will commit to you the true riches? So in this, I want us to see. It says, therefore, if you've not, wrong one. If he who is faithful in what is least will also be faithful much. He who is faithful with a material thing will also be faithful with the, with the eternal things of the kingdom. Because the Lord trusts the kingdom. What, is, what does Paul tell Timothy? Find what kind of men to trust these things to? Faithful men. Find faithful men. Faithfulness calls us to be trusted with the kingdom and with the things of eternity. And Jesus even tells us, he says, my father's pleased to give you the kingdom. He's pleased to. And I think sometimes the test and the, it's, 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 and when I, 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 I try to look at the word test and I always try to connect it with prove because I don't want to ever feel like the Lord's putting me into a place to see if our I'll pass or fail, but it's to expose so we can handle and move on. Wow. Yeah. It's always a proving, not, not really test is the word we have because we talk about testing, you know, precious metals and gold, but it's, it's a proving. Why was Israel in the wilderness? To prove what was in their hearts, basically to draw what was in their heart out in front of them so they could see it. Now, what you do with it once you see it, is what happened is where you know the the path is chosen when it's exposed we take it we grab it we take it to the lord we sacrifice it give it to the lord as an offering this is something that is inside of me this does not belong here this is something i give to you i die to myself i take up my cross and we move on So the mammon is, a, is, a, is the test of stewardship to be entrusted with the things of the kingdom. Verse 12, it says, you have not been faithful in what is another man's who will give you your own. Okay, so next, we have where the Lord tests us or shows us, gives the opportunity for stewardship to be a good servant so what? We can be entrusted with the eternal things, but what if the Lord is putting you in charge of stewarding somebody else's things? That place is actually a gate, and the stewardship is the hinge, and your good stewardship will hinge, that gate will open on that, and it will open you up to be able to receive your own. So maybe even we need to be careful and, don't, and look at our jobs. Maybe your job is a place of stewardship the Lord's put you. It's a place the Lord's put you to develop things, but also to see if you'll be faithful with another man's, even though it's not your own, even though at the end of the day you go home and it goes there. But if you'll be faithful with that, and what's the other word he uses? He uses just. If we'll be just with it, he'll give us your own. Then you can be trusted with your own. John three twenty seven. This is one of my... My favorite verse is the Lord uses this a lot with me because he's patient. <laughs> but it's when John the Baptist's disciples, they come to him and they say, look, Lord, the one that you, that you baptized, everybody's going to him now. And John the Baptist, by the Holy Spirit, knows. He says, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. And just to take that a step further is you may try to take something, but you'll never be able to really receive it unless it's been released to you by, from heaven. Wow. Lots of times we can see or we can run around and we could be trying to make things for ourselves, or maybe we can be trying to do something that the Lord is really not leading us to do. We can be trying to build something, make something with our own hands, but it never really brings satisfaction. Why? Because you can't, you can do it, but you haven't been given the ability to receive it. Or somebody could be 
doing something for you, you know, trying to be nice, but maybe, and this is just a picture, not that the Lord does this, but just to give you an illustration that maybe you're not able to receive it in the same way. Heaven has to open the door for you of your heart to be able to take things into yourself, to be able to handle them correctly. So also let that bring freedom to know if the Lord's bringing something to you to know I have the ability to receive this because heaven brought this. I didn't ask for this. I mean, and sometimes there is an asking. You know, we can't just put a cookie cutter mold on every situation because we have to be led by the Spirit. But just know that if the Lord's bringing you something or put something in front of you, that you do have the ability and he's going to allow give you the uh, um put you in a position to be able to receive it. And if it feels like you can't, you know, that's a good time to go to the Lord and say, Lord, is this coming from you or is man giving me this? Is this coming from heaven or is this coming from man? Verse 13, it says, no servant can serve two masters because you'll either hate one and love the other. You cannot serve what? God and mammon. So the things are trusted to us because we trust God. Not because we trust the things. We're not pursuing the things. We're pursuing the Father. And out of the pursuit of the Father, he puts things in our paths. It's, it's like, uh, I guess, Ruth and Boaz would be a good thing. She was pursuing righteousness and what she needed to be doing, and things were just laid out in front of her. You know, we, don't, we do not serve riches. There's a John Bevere quote. It's, his, uh, it's a book, Fear fear of the Lord and it's there's something in the beginning that I can't recall exactly but he's basically he says you need to fear the Lord and you have to be careful because whoever you fear you will serve so if you fear man you will serve man if you fear God you will serve God so let's put riches in this if you fear what you if you serve what you fear be careful that stress and anxiety and fear does not creep into your finances because now you will serve him. If you fear money, you will serve money. But if we fear God, we will serve God. Matthew, let's do Matthew 21. I'm going to start to wrap it up with this. And thank the Lord for grace, you know? Amen. Even when he gives stuff to us, gosh, don't overlook it. Don't think it's all on my ability. The Lord gives you the ability, but he's walking with you. Yeah. You know, when we do mess it up, when we do fumble it, the Lord's there, we get to learn and move on. You know, it's not something where, he, you know, you've fumbled something and the Lord kicks you out right off the rip, you know. Thank God. Yeah, gosh, thank God. You know, even for me personally, this has, been a, this has been an interesting week, you know, and I knew I was going to get up here today, and I just had to say, Lord, thank you for grace. Thank you for grace. Amen. And don't be afraid to share that kind of stuff with people, you know, if the Lord leads you to. Maybe somebody else is going through something, and they need to know that you're not the picture of you that they've put in, in their head, you know. You know, you tell people, gosh, you know, this, not that you don't want to get a place complaining, but you want to say, like, hey, it's okay. You know, things happen. They say, gosh, I never thought that you did that or that, you know, I mean, and that's, we're all human, right? Let's be real people. Uh, 21 verse 33. He says, here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went to a far country. Here it is again. He, he entrusts somebody with something and then what happens? He leaves. That they, that they might receive his fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. I believe if I was the third one to go, I'd be like, you know, <laughs> send him. <laughs> <laughs> Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize the inheritance. 
So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the, land, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And then the, they said to Jesus, they said, he will destroy those wicked men and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render him the fruits in their season. And Jesus said to them, have you ever read, this, read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was, my, this was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, and he's talking to the religious leaders of the time. He says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but whoever on whomever it falls will be ground into powder. So what do we see? We see an example where a stewardship is taken away. Why? It was unprofitable. Same thing we saw in the beginning. The unprofitable servant was the one that was cast out. So we see right here that the kingdom was trusted to a, a, a group of people in Israel. And what do you see in the Bible? We see where Jesus comes, the Messiah comes, and he dies, and he opens it up to everybody and hands it off to the apostles to do the work. He, he entrusts them. You know, he tells them, he says, to you it's been given the ability to understand and perceive the things of the kingdom. He gives it to them. He's the one that gives the revelation. He's the one that gives it to them. Why? Because there was a group that was unprofitable. But then remember Romans 12, it says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Just to flip the coin because he says that Israel will come back. He's talking to the church when he says that. It's not don't think more highly of yourself over your friend, even though you should do that. But he's talking to you know, the Gentiles, and he says, don't think that you're above the Jews or you're more whatever than them because the kingdom's been entrusted to you. So we don't ever need to think that way. You know, Jesus, he come from Israel. We pray for their peace. I got off on a tangent. <laughs> They're unprofitable. That was the thing, unfruitful. Same pattern that we see in the, in the other in the other parables, we see that the unfruitful ones and the unprofitable ones are the ones that the stewardship is removed from. And now these next ones, I just got a couple. You don't have to turn to them. But I got examples of uh, ones that it was the stewardship was removed from and the ones that it was entrusted to. So you have Israel. You have the Jewish, the religious leaders of that time. It was taken away from them because they weren't bringing the fruit. They weren't bringing it to God. And what about Saul? Saul was entrusted with something, but he was disobedient. He was told to kill Agag. He was told to kill everything, and he didn't do it. And it says that the Lord took it from him. The word of the Lord come through Samuel as when, when you know, Saul was pretty much pleading and reached for Samuel, and, and the, the piece of his robe ripped off, he said, in the same way the kingdom has been ripped from your hands. Why? He wasn't a good steward. He feared men, so he served men. He wasn't a God servant of God. He was a servant of man. Positive note, King David. What do we see of David? He was a lowly boy. He was the one that nobody batted an eye at, and he was out keeping sheep. And he was being a shepherd. And he was ministering to the Lord. And he feared God, so he served God. David had a revelation of the nature of the father that we struggle with sometimes today. Because he played his instrument and he worshipped his way into it. Into, into something that, not, that he hadn't heard from a prophet. He worshiped his way into something that nobody had told him, but that he had experienced. He had tasted and seen that the Lord was good. And what happened? He was a good steward. Not because anybody told him to, but because he knew the nature of the master. And what happens? And I think it's 2 Samuel. Yeah, 2 Samuel verse 7, whenever, um, chapter 7, whenever David is saying, you know, I want to build you a house. And the Lord makes this statement to him. He said, I took you from among the sheep, and I set you over my people. Faithful with little, ruler over much. He was faithful with another man's. 
and he was given the Lord's. He was given his own things, but the people, he understood that they were the Lord's sheep. And he understood that he was to be faithful, and the Lord elevated him from that place where he was at. Look at Moses. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness looking after sheep that weren't his. It says in Exodus 3 that he was, he was at the mountain in the wilderness looking after his father-in-law's sheep. And then in the New Testament, it tells us that, he was, that it was 40 years that he was there doing that. 40 years looking after something that's not yours. Faithfully. Faithfully looking after something that's not yours. Taking care of it. Bring an increase to the flock. Because he was trusted with it. And what do we see? He is the man that has an encounter with God in that place of serving, in that place of being a good steward, on the backside of the mountain, he is in that place, and the Lord appears to him. And he says that he's been chosen. And immediately, you know, we could go all the way back to Matthew 25. Why is he chosen? Because the Lord knows the ability is there because he put it there. And what does he do? He starts to back up. No, nah, Lord, I can't do this. I can't do this. No, the ability is there, and I'm looking for increase. The ability is there. And the bills come due. Not in a bad way. But the things that are in there, the Lord is going to He's going to bring it out. And once it's brought out, it's our choice which road we take. Are we going to be the faithful and good one? Use it to bring increase. Use it for the kingdom. Use it for the glory of God. Matthew tells us that, that, that people should see our good works and glorify us. No. Glor <laughs> glorify us. Trick, gotcha. <laughs> glorify the Father. God, <laughs> glorify the Father. I heard a pastor, a different preacher I was listening to one time, and he began to lay out these, show, talking about these different people that had passed away, like, uh, like Elvis. He said, was Elvis an amazing singer? If he was that amazing, they wouldn't have contests and people that could sing just like him. You know, directly be able to impersonate him up to sing exactly like him. What marked him is he was anointed. He had something different in a generation, but he took the glory to himself and it destroyed him. Michael Jackson. Gifted, gifted, awesome. Something, a, a gift and an ability given from God. If glory is not given to the Lord, we're not meant to carry it. It'll destroy us. It's not our glory. It's not ours. To be able to, I mean, just to be able to stand up here in the natural, I, this was never something I could do, you know. Glory is to God. Glory is to God. Somebody that, if you're a mechanic, if you're somebody that works on things, you know, if you're a decorator, God puts those abilities in there. God puts them in there. And we have to give glory back to the Father. Always, in everything that we do. Everything that we do. And it's not to the place, I don't know if y'all listen to Bill Johnson, but he, he uses this story where he, he says, we have to be able to receive glory. Rec we don't take the glory to ourselves, but we receive compliments because if you don't, you'll never have a crown to give to Jesus. He said that he, he had this quote where he said that he told somebody, um, that they had sang something really good, and they said, well, it's, it was Jesus. And he said, well, it wasn't that good. <laughs> but really, to, you know, but I, I used to say that same thing. You know, thank the Lord, but no, you, you say thank you, and then you go in secret, and we give glory to the Father. We take it, and then in secret, you give it back to him. Because the things done in secret are the things that the Father's looking for. All right, that's it. Let's stand. Thank you. If there's anybody here, I just feel impressed on this. If there's anybody here that has anything that you've been entrusted to or something that's come in front of you, a battle that you got going on, something at work, at home, that you feel is 
something that you've never faced and something that feels a little heavier, more than you can handle, would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you guys. Father, I just pray for grace. You wouldn't have brought the things to us if you weren't going to help us out and see us through it. Lord Jesus, I just pray for your hand on, and you're just coming alongside each one of these people. Father, I put a demand on the ability on the inside of them. Father, I speak to fear and I say that you hush your mouth in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your confidence that comes through you. You are our confidence. You are our one thing. Holy Spirit, I pray for uh, just divine, just divine ways of doing things. That you would lead them, that you would give them ideas. Father, I speak sweet sleep over them. No more sleep will be lost because of any of these things. Your promise is that we trust in you and that we will lie down in peace and sleep. So I expect every one of these people that raise their hand to go to, to lay down tonight and they will sleep peacefully. We thank you for it ahead of time. Go ahead and tell the Lord, thank you for sweet sleep. I thank you, Father, for sweet sleep. We thank you that they can sleep. We thank you that we can rest. And we rest because we trust in you. Father God, we lift you up. We lift up Jesus. And we, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for just coming alongside, for being inside of us. We love you and we praise you. We give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. One more thing, if there's anybody here and you are not following Jesus and you want to make that decision, you want to say that you want to follow Jesus, that there's something missing in your life, you're not sure what it is, and you don't have to have all the answers right now, but if you just want to start on the journey, will you please raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's pray this. Let's all say, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, help us to follow you. And we decide to walk in your will for our lives. We receive you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.